Welcome to this edition of History and Highballs, Ebony Wine and Spirits. My name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the museum. So whenever you join us for one of these History and Highballs programs, you and I get to virtually spend the evening together listening to some incredible stories about North Carolina places and people and what makes our state so special. If you enjoy tonight's program, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at ncmuseumofhistory.org, where you can learn more about our upcoming programs, exhibits, and digital resources. This is also where you can learn more information about joining our wonderful North Carolina Museum of History Associates. Um, our associates and foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programs like this evening's event possible. Uh, we would like to thank those of you who donated funds towards this evening's program. We continue to do our best to keep our programs free to attend, um, but there are costs associated with keeping our series going, and we just continue to be so humbled by your generous support of the museum. A few quick housekeeping items for this evening. We ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program, and to please type any questions that you have for a guest speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the program, our intern Savannah will ask our speaker as many of your questions as time allows. So it's my honor to introduce this evening's speaker and welcome Camelia Masunda, founder and owner of Ebony Wine and Spirits. Uh, mother, daughter, auntie, serial entrepreneur, HBCU grad, author, philanthropist, activist. These are just a few of the terms that define Camellia Masunda, founder and owner of Ebony Wine and Spirits, Charlotte's first black owned winery. Ebony Wine was created to celebrate black culture and unity across the globe. The company is on a mission to use its wine as a trophy and symbol of solidarity, healing and unity and appreciating the diversity of black people. Camellia, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Welcome, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. I'm so ecstatic and I'm so excited to be here this evening. I'd like to first say greetings and I'd like to extend a great big welcome to everyone here on the live. It's like 42 people. So for me, this is absolutely amazing. Hi, everyone, friends, families, cousins, aunties, uncles, um, and just my North Carolina family and family from all over the globe. Um, if I was at the Museum of History and we would be celebrating this event, I'd make my way across the room and be able to put my arms around and hug everyone. However, we're not, we're in the, the Zoom culture. So here we are. So just use your imagination and picture me giving you one of the best hugs that you've ever had. Um, it is with great gratitude that I say thank you for joining us this evening. And a big thank you to the North Carolina Museum of History. This is an amazing opportunity um, to share um, not only my story, but to celebrate BIPOC people in the wine um, industry and tell their stories. But even more than that, I hope that someone is moved and inspired this evening to go after whatever he or she desires. I believe in law of attraction. I believe that everything that you put out in the universe is powerful and comes a hundred and comes back a hundredfold. Um, and that's something I've learned from my greatest inspiration, who is my mother. If you leave here with nothing else this evening, please. Um, please honor and, and treasure um, the opportunity to love on people. Um, love is something that is beautiful. It's an amazing gift and it's absolutely free. So give it away uh, freely and watch it return a hundredfold. So let's get started. All right, Ebony Wine and Spirits. Ultimately, Ebony Wine and Spirits represents um, limitless possibility. We are on a mission to change the wine industry um, and to really celebrate um, the history and the culture and the legacy, what is uh, Black and melanated culture from around the world. Um, as a serial entrepreneur, I understand what it means to not only be in a business, but to be of service. Um, and through my experiences within in this industry and other industries, um, I believe in using every platform that we have to one, definitely celebrate um, the legacy of wine, but to really understand that it is our mission to always be of service. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. 
All right, so as you see here, this is where you imagine me giving you that amazing hug this evening and just welcoming you into, um, hey, history and high balls. Is, for me, this is a, a full circle moment to have this platform and to be able to share here with you this evening. Uh, this uh, picture that you see here is one of uh, the many events that we've traveled to all over the country where we meet the people who support who we are, our mission, and what we do and who truly enjoy celebrating wine. I think it's something special when you not only get to um, celebrate and drink and experience ebony wine, but to truly get to experience um, the people um, behind it being myself and just our team. So yeah, thank you guys. All right, so... This is uh, an amazing opportunity for me. Um, just looking at those varietals, really understanding um, if you don't know what varietals are, just the, the wines that you see here, understanding that everything that it takes to bring wine full circle from venting and bottling and to do the research that that comes behind wine. So if you ever see someone in wine and whether it's a big company or a small company, just really treasuring um, everything that they had to do uh, to get to that point. And this journey has been uh, groundbreaking for myself. This journey has been just a true gift and a true, um, a true testament to what it means to be uh, steadfast and to pour uh, your dreams and your legacy into something special. So we are so happy again to be here as Ebony Wine and Spirits. All right, so how many of you guys know this movie? I hope that you can just immediately identify this movie. And if you can't, uh, let me give you some insight to why we say, when did you fall in love with wine? So this movie is one of my favorite, favorite movies. It's called Brown Sugar. And so the actual quote is, when did you fall in love with hip hop? But for me, this would be, when did you fall in love with wine? So sit back and relax as I tell you the story of when I fell in love with wine. So I fell in love with wine in my 20s, um, finding myself reading bottles and labels. I remember, um, going to parties and going to events and I would always be that annoying friend um, that would ask who brought the wine um, because at this time I, I thought I was you know a wine connoisseur and I knew uh, pretty much nothing about wine but I thought I knew everything about wine so I, I would always ask hey who brought the wine and where did they get the wine and where did they did they get the wine from and I think it became to be annoying to some of my to some of my friends to the point that they would just be annoyed and say, "Hey, don't even worry about it. You just bring the wine. We'll drink whatever you want us to drink." I re also remember attending my first wine tasting. I actually won this ticket from a raffle, um, and this uh, raffle was it was actually a very funny uh, story in that it was a raffle that was at a, like a basketball game and yeah so somehow my name got called and I was super and I was super excited to um win this wine win this wine tasting so I go into I'm, I'm very underdressed because yeah I'm I'm thinking a wine tasting is uh was going to be this very simple thing but this particular wine tasting was a very uh black tie affair wine tasting so I still go into the wine tasting and I'm excited to try all the wines and I noticed that everyone is, um, you know, they're tasting, they're swishing, and they're spitting their wine out. However, me, I'm swallowing all of the wine, <laughs> which if you know about anything about wine tasting, um, that, that's not exactly how you, how you do it. So during that tasting, I also noticed that I was the only um, person uh, of color. I was the only black person attending the event. Uh, I was very proud to be there because, you know, I was um, continuing, you know, just my wine journey and learning about wine. But I also felt in a sense um, out of place. I told myself, like I told myself then that I wanted to start a wine business. That was like a, a aha moment for me um, to 
you know, just start writing my writing in my journal and writing things down that I wanted to happen. I didn't know much about I didn't know much about wine, but I knew then that I wanted more faces in wine. I wanted to see more people who looked like myself. I started going to um, I started going to more and more um, paint and sips. I started um, experiencing vineyards for the first time. Um, and within those experiences, I was still finding myself. I was still I was still finding who I was, but I was still noticing that in those experiences that I wasn't seeing, I would see one person or two, you know, two people, but it was all, but it was always um, a sense of feeling um, like per se, I didn't belong, but I was still excited um, to learn. The more I explored, the more stores I, you know, the more stores I went to, um, I began to get bolder and I just, I began to ask um, the different um, clerks. I began to say, how do you know of any um, black people who, you know, who are, who have wine brands and they would politely respond, you know, we don't, I don't think we carry any, um, wine brands that you know were created by black wine cre wine creators um and this more so intrigued me and it just really gave me the feeling it really gave me that uh nudge to say hey this is really a big this is bigger than you think it is and so um i continued to learn and i continued to fall in love with wine but those few moments especially the moment where i watching people um spit their wine out and me swallowing my wine i think that was definitely um the aha moment in the sense of i wanted to know more about wine all right so culture culture is what we see here with ebony wine you see um, the dress you see the bottling you see the expression um, falling in love with wine i knew from day one i wanted to be different um, in the wine industry i wanted to tell a story and i wanted our wine to mean something i wanted for people to not only sip the wine not only share the wine but to emotionally become attached uh, to our to our brand and to our wines to know that they meant something. So with Ebony Wine and Spirits, really understanding um, what celebrating Black unity and culture all over the globe really means. So if you have a bottle of Ebony Wine here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you see your brother or sister or you're FaceTiming someone or WhatsApp via London or via Honduras, and you can have those, you know, you and they have that wine. It's a it's a certain level of connection, it's a certain level of solidarity and celebration. And that is our ultimate mission in Ebony Wine, really understanding that people of color are all over the world. We have a lot of the same struggles. We have a lot of the, you know, us, the same heritage and history. And even and even our differences make us amazing and it makes us unique, but it should be celebrated. Moving right along. So next slide. So when you look at this house, it looks like a typical country house. Um, that you might see in the mountains, um, but this house is this this house is a very uh, it's not a house it's actually something very special. Um, but this what looks to be a house is um, what we know as the Woodburn Plantation, um, and what's so special and unique about this house is that this belong this home belongs to well this place belongs to John, John excuse me John June. Lewis Sr. And John June Lewis Sr. Um, is a story that I never knew anything about. Um, it, it's a story that you probably won't find a lot of information about because a lot of the information is just being written. A lot of the information is just being told. And even if you go on YouTube, you could probably find maybe one video, um, a short video about this story. But um, this story is absolutely amazing. So John um, June Lewis Sr. Um, was the first Black American winemaker. He was actually born to, he was actually um, inherited 10 and, and was gifted 10 acres of land from the slave master who was actually his father. Um, John Lewis Sr. would um, fall in love with viticulture um, when he was in World War I in Europe. 
Um, and a little after prohibition ended, that's when he, he inherited the land in Clarksville, Virginia. And this is around 1933, he began to grow his first grapes on the land. And in the 1940s, Lewis opened Woodburn Winery and sold his wine locally until he passed in 1974. The Woodburn Winery is the first Black American owned winery. Um, and the operation ran through the 1970s. His business was not only um, the first Black owned winery, but his business was the only Virginia based winery that manufactured its products solely through harvesting its own grapes. And if you could only imagine um, when people tell you, hey, especially black wine creators, it's not easy to get into the wine industry, but imagine 19, 1940s. And if you wanna talk about someone turning lemons into lemonade, he inherited this land and created a winery. He took what he learned in World War I in Europe um, through his love for wine and love for grapes. He bought it back to the United States, took his situation, and he planted grapes on land that he inherited. And so for me, that story is very powerful. Ironically, um, this is, I didn't know about the story when I found Ebony Wine and Spirits. So um, it's the rabbit hole. Once you start, once you start reading and once you start learning, um, you want to know more. And this picture here, this is him. This is John Lewis, John June Lewis Sr. Um, and that's his, and that's his wine. And I think that's a staple in history. I think it should be in history books. I think it's the unsung, you know, uh, unsung history um, that should be celebrated. Um, you know, again, of course we're in Black History Month, but this is a type of history that should be in history books and that should be celebrated all year long. Um, so for me, when I was looking for inspiration, I didn't per se see the inspiration. And I think the lack of seeing the inspiration gave me hope and it gave, but it also told me that this does exist. And just because you don't um, see the, you don't hear the story or just because you don't see, see the story and the information, um, I think you should know that people have, people of color and black people, BIPOC people have been creating wine and spirits um, throughout history. They, uh, and this is for, before, this is like back in DC. So one thing about, um, one thing about people who control history, um, they tend to write history how they want history to be seen. Um, and with whoever they want controlling um, certain parts of history, but even from Jack Daniels, to here with John Lewis, we have, we play a major role. We were right beside, we were there, we were creating, we have always been a part of the history that is the wine and spirits industry. All right, so what you see here is Iris Bordeaux. Um, wow, just, understanding how for me this is becoming full circle. So last year, uh, which was our first complete year in the wine industry, I somehow had the opportunity to be on a panel next to, excuse me, Iris Rideau. Iris Rideau is actually the first Black woman wine owner um, in the United States. This would happen two decades after John June Lewis um, Sr., and this woman is a, a testament of this, the entrepreneur and the powerhouse that she was. We could go into um, her, her backstory. She started out with about six acres. Um, a few years later, I think almost six years later, she turned them into like 24 acres. Um, she uh, was an entrepreneur. She is, she's still here. She actually follows us. <laughs> she follows and supports us on Instagram. And she's actually like a spitfire. So she She's alive and well, telling her story, telling us about the wine industry. And I was so blessed um, last year to be a part of the Uncult Culture panel um, of the state of Black wine and business live conversation. And right up under there, if you look here on this poster, I mean, on this flyer, you can see I'm right up under Iris Rideau. And I think that for me was just a full circle moment um, to really, uh, one, tell me I'm in the right place and tell me that I'm doing the right thing. Um, and let's, and for me, this is also a celebration of uh, 
of platforms like Uncult Culture. Um, and if you can follow them, look them up. They celebrate uh, Black people in the wine industry. They tell our story. Um, they support our events. And they have their own platform of content to ensure that our stories are told, to ensure that we are celebrated um, in the wine industry, not just Black owned wine industry, but in the wine industry um, across the board. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, so I've also had so I've also had the experience of of really diving into the wine industry and understanding that the wine industry, although one percent, um, it is vast and it is moving, and the one percent is is many. It's a one percent of many. So this is Kim Lewis to the under um, Iris Rideau. Kim Lewis is the first black owned winery uh, in New Orleans. Um, she's absolutely amazing. I would call her a friend and a mentor. Um, I could actually call her for any question that I could possibly have. Um, anything about the wine industry, anything about distribution, she was there um, to um, lift me up and encourage and to keep us to keep us going. And I think that's something that makes the wine industry, the black on wine industry amazing in itself because it's so much unity um, that is going on to ensure that our stories are are never forgotten, that our stories won't be um, that we are the one percent in the uh, you know in the coming years. Um, also, you see Abner Montflair. So Abner Montflair is, um, he's a friend, I call him a colleague, he's actually like a little brother. He is an amazing uh, wine creator out of, uh, out of Maryland. He actually, uh, his, his mission is to teach other Black young men um, about the wine industry so that they don't take as long to get in the wine industry and understand that there are opportunities for them in viticulture and in the wine in the wine or spirits industry. He's actually only 25 years old and his company um, uh, Montclair Duvain um, is absolutely amazing and is soaring. But again, it's an testament to the growth and to the newcomers such as myself who are in the wine industry and who are coming um, in full force and who are changing the trajectory of what we know to be the new wine industry. Next slide, please. Wow. So what is this? So obstacles. So in my first year, excuse me, excuse me. So overcoming obstacles. In the wine industry, I've definitely faced some obstacles, but I also know that um, I was always destined for great things because obstacles were not something new um, for me in my life. Overcoming obstacles um, in the wine industry has been a journey, but I like to think life has prepared me for this journey. In life, I've come to learn, um, I've come to learn that the, the things that we are experienced, uh, the things that we experience um, give us the ability to have determination. And it literally coasts us to our destiny. It is crazy how you may you may not recall, excuse me, it's crazy how, because I'm going off my notes, guys, but I know all of this. So, so it's honestly crazy how you, you know, you may not remember what you had for breakfast and you may not remember if you sent the email, but you actually remember like these aha moments that are in your life that kind of shape how you are um, via your strength or your wisdom or your integrity. And for me, I have a few major moments that shape that for me, um, even coming into the wine industry. I recall one, I recall my first grade teacher. I can't tell you what I had for breakfast, but I can recall my first grade teacher. I can tell you her name. I can tell you what she looked like. Her name was Miss Seegers. And I remember she told my mother, uh, I remember her telling my mother that I'd never be able to learn. I don't know why I remember that, but I remember I remember that. And it kind of, it was the, imagine being in first grade and being so little, but you hear something like that. And I think what you hear really shapes your thoughts. It can shape your thoughts if you allow it to. And it, it's just always stuck with me. Um, I also remember, I can also recall in sixth grade of uh, my math teacher, 
I remember him being very mean, very rude, um, you know, and math was something that I struggled with, but I remember him almost failing me on purpose in a sense and ultimately um, holding me back in the sixth grade. Um, I don't remember his name, but I always remember him because he was so negative in the sense of telling you what you can't do or what you'll never be. I also remember uh, in this moment right here uh, is such an aha moment for me. I remember feeling proud that um, I had my daughter. And even though I was 15 and I was breastfeeding her, I was proud to be able to do so. I also remember how heartbroken I was from the just negative stares and people who um, would whisper or just, you know, or discuss um, you know, just being a team, you know, she's a team mother. I recall every tear, but I also recall my mother um, always being there, always being there to cheer me up or encourage me to, to hold my head up and be proud and to keep, um, keep going. Little did I know that these key moments of what I thought was failures would ultimately shape, the, shape my success. Because without failure, you can't have success. They're, they're twofold. And for me, these moments of feeling rejected or feeling, um, feeling emotional or sad or not good enough would shape me in the sense of it made me feel that the determination and that, that I would be able to absolutely do everything. It was like, if I can get through this, there's nothing I absolutely can't do. Next slide. So that, that same little girl that I, uh, not gonna cry, not gonna cry. Okay. So that same little girl, excuse me, that I remember breastfeeding um, and uh, I remember holding her hand, I remember those obstacles um, would absolutely change the trajectory of my life. I remember um, this moment specifically um, is her graduating top of her class. You can see the ropes on her neck. I remember her graduating top of her class and again, that was just an aha moment, um, going on a scholarship, an engineer major, heading to college. And it really, those are the moments I think that really shaped, shaped, shaped me as a person to really understand that everything in life absolutely happens for a reason. And the backstories really um, from your personal life to your professional life um, is what keeps you keeping on and what keeps you motivated and what keeps you going, um, keeps you going. <clears throat> so to close out, um, to close out um, this, this particular part um, this evening, as I said earlier, um, life really leaves you breadcrumbs and these breadcrumbs uh, bring you back to where you're going and why you're supposed and um, why you're supposed to be there. I look at where I look at being 15. I look at um, certain things that people said. I look at um, how my how I was, you know, just told what you couldn't do and how in life, not just myself, but people in general are told what they can't do and the obstacles that um, you're faced with and how they are there to not only, they're there to build you up, they're there to, to be obstacles, but they're there to build you and to make you strong so that you're able to get through certain things. Next slide, please. All right, so that same girl would become, that same girl that I was breastfeeding would actually become our creative director of Ebony Wine and Spirits. Um, the, a major part, a major force um, into what our company has, has done. Um, the face of our brand, the culture in our brand, it all goes, it all goes through her. It, um, from the backstory, from the branding to the, to the labels, on the bottles, they're created 
by her um, to the, the colors, how she taught me about uh, colors and emotions and what colors to shape the bot, you know, to create um, in our wine. Um, I'm honestly my one of my greatest inspirations would be uh, my will always be uh, my daughter and what she has brought into uh, my life and what she has bought into um, my brand um, and our in our in the major role that she plays into our company and the concept and the ideologies of legacy. So. Ebony Wine and Spirits um, has always been on a mission to not only impact the wine industry, but to impact the community. And in a way that encourages our youth to always believe in what they can do. I believe that our stories within the wine industry have to be told because if you cannot see it, um, oftentimes you can't believe, you know, you can't believe it. And even if I could, I wanted, I always wanted to be able to serve the youth in a sense of always giving them something to look up to, something to believe in. And um, we make it, we, we serve on purpose within our brand um, and within our company. Ebony Wine and Spirits does not move without the community. It does not move without service. So as a serial entrepreneur, everything that we've done, everything that we do has always come back into community. So one of my biggest inspirations, who is my mother, again, we uh, go back. I told you one of those obstacles was, was uh, that first grade teacher. And I remember how she told me, hey, you would never learn, uh, you know, just saying those negative things. And so my mother always had this, had a vision of having a child development center um, and we have partnered uh, to do so. We've been in business as far as education and um, serving underserved communities um, within that vision, um, within our child development center. It's the Afrocentric Child Development Center, and um, we teach youth who they are. We celebrate their back. You know, we, we celebrate their background, but more importantly, we ensure that no one will be able to tell them what they can't do and what they can't learn. And um, from Ebony Wine and Spirits to our Cultural Giving Development Center, we serve on purpose. My greatest, inspir uh, my greatest inspirations, my greatest inspiration will always be my mother. Um, she has always been my, uh, she's been always my greatest support. She believes in me no matter what. And when I say no matter what, I have always been a rainbow child, um, a dreamer. I dream very big. And she has always been there um, in the sense of, um, if you believe you can do it, you can do it. And um, just to have someone like that by your side throughout life, um, it's inspirational in itself. History, heritage, and culture. Uh, I am a proud Congolese American. Um, my father, uh, grandmother, I have family in Congo to this day. Um, I believe uh, that history and heritage are one and the same. I believe that you, when, when someone has an attachment to identity, um, they, they become prideful. They're prideful about who they are. They're prideful about what they create. And so in the creation of Ebony Wine and Spirits, that was, that's definitely our mission to really um, celebrate um, from whether it be immigrants, whether it be people um, of, of certain cultures in that country, we have to understand that our ancestry and our history and our heritage run deep. Um, it may not always be documented, but to have to know and to celebrate who you are and to know who you are is an absolute gift. I'm thankful um, to be Congolese. My last name is Masunda. Um, I'm thankful for my father. I'm thankful for my grandmother. I'm thankful for my family um, who instilled certain things. And um, I'm thankful for you. Sangonini, um, it means thank you in Lingala, which is our native language. All right, so 
when I told you guys uh, earlier that I believe history um, and your journey will always leave breadcrumbs, John Lewis um, Sr., John June Lewis Sr., as we know, was the first uh, winemaker in the United States. Well, one of my missions um, and one thing that I'm very proud to say that I've always uh, been in service in the community and this particular, um, this particular moment is with John Lewis. Uh, John Lewis, the amazing, wow, the amazing activist, congressman, um, and community leader. Um, I was at this meeting um, at this time. Um, it was a terrible um, shooting in the community, um, police shooting in the community. And um, I was a part of a community organization and I was at a meeting um, with Mr. John, uh, Mr. John Lewis, and out of everyone in there, Mr. Lewis pulls my hand and kind of pulls me to the side. And he, why I don't know, but I remember him asking me, "What do you want in life?" And what was what was my dream? Um, which was, you know, I was really taken aback. I was really shocked that he would pull me to the side because the room is full and um, I'm actually stepping, you know, I'm actually stepping outside and you know, to have him, excuse me, pull me to the side out of everybody in the room, I just, I, I didn't know why. So when he asked me that, um, I, I, asked it, I'm asked, I asked him again and I said, excuse me, um, what did you say, sir? Um, what He said, what do you want? What do you want out of, like, what do you want out of life? And I remember responding to him that I told him that I wanted to be impactful I wanted that I wanted everything that I do to have purpose and to and to serve. And I remember him telling me, then do it loud and with integrity. That was it. He said, do it loud and do it with integrity. And that's something that I carried with me um, throughout throughout life. Um, again, this was a couple of days. Ironically, this was a couple of days um, before I began to truly go back and work on Ebony Wine and Spirits. I began to truly horn in on the construct of what I wanted um, our company to be and what I wanted our mission to and what I wanted our mission to be. I'd like to think that this was my official breadcrumb calling me into the wine industry. So this evening, um, I hope that you took enough information to understand uh, who we are. Uh, yes, we're the first black owned wine and spirits company based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, I'm a Congolese American. I am uh, an auntie. I am a mother. I'm a daughter. Um, I am embedded into my community, a community that has served me. Um, Charlotte, North Carolina has served me in a tremendous way. Um, communities and schools. Um, I was I was definitely a part of communities and schools for a long time. Um, pretty much, you know, the whole way throughout, you know, my matriculation in school. Safe Journey, which was a teenage mother uh, program that would also ultimately serve uh, me in so many different ways. They ensured my path to to college and and my education. I've had countless mentors from Felicia Davis. Um, who, who I met in high school and who would um, be my mentor and, and my family to this day. Um, Tracy Picker, who would be my principal and who would also be a mentor to this day. Um, so to, to create a wine um, with, with no integrity behind it would mean nothing for me, but to create a wine and spirits company that honors one culture, heritage and unity but that also celebrates the community that, that created a space that celebrated me um, is the, was always the ultimate goal. I thank you um, for being here with me this evening. And I hope that you continue to tell a story what is Ebony Wine and Spirits, but what is BIPOC people in the wine and spirits industry. Thank you. Okay, now I'm here to ask questions. 
Um, so somebody wants to know if you have a wine club membership they could possibly join. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we actually so we're actually revamping our website um it's being like a deep revamp um and next month for women's history month we launch a new wine club so uh definitely follow us on instagram you can go ahead and still join our um, email list um so you can get an update exactly when our new um information and new site information goes up and thank you so much for your support <laughs> Do you probably get this a lot, but do you have a favorite kind of wine that your company makes? I'm curious. I'm new to wine. <laughs> so this is called, oh, can you see it? Because we blew it out. So yeah. Is, okay. So maybe if I pull up, okay, this way. All right. So this is called Kinshasa. We call it the taste of the sun. Um, let's, let's just say this. If you taste it, then you'll understand why we call it the taste of the sun. But Kinshasa is the capital of Congo. It's where my family is from. Um, it's a beautiful, it's an absolutely beautiful place. Um, but I've always wanted, again, in everything we do, um, to lead people to research and to um, understand why it's so amazing. I would say this, it takes you on a complete trip um, across the globe uh, on, through your taste buds. So definitely, I don't have a favorite wine because I love, I love them all, but um, our Kinshasa is, is the favorite um, for our supporters. That's incredible. Someone <laughs> wants to know what advice you would give to those who are seeking a mentor in the wine industry. Um, stalk them. That's what I would say. Stalk them because... <laughs> No, I, I, in a good way, though, um, one thing that I've learned is that um, any time that I've wanted any type of mentorship, I didn't go in just wanting mentorship. I've always asked them, how can I be of service? Um, is there anything that I can, you know, anything that you need help with? Is there anything that I can do? I am looking for mentorship, but I would love to have the opportunity to um, possibly learn from you in a way that I can add value. Mabel wants to know if you have a winery that they can come visit in Charlotte. Okay, so we do have we do have a location, but um, right now you definitely you cannot come visit. But we have something that is so grand and so amazing in the works that. Uh, yeah, please just join the email list because once it happens, then you'll be able to come. Uh, and this will be happening next month. So um, as far as you coming in to have a tasting right now, we're doing some things at our, our location, uh, which we're not traditional in any type of way, but we have something amazing for our supporters that's about to happen. So follow, join the email list. Somebody's asking if you have a Facebook. Does, is it Ebony Wine and Spirits? Yes. Okay. Yes. Ebony Wine and Spirits. Okay. Um, Sherry does not have a question, but she wanted to comment that you have given her a new appreciation for wine and your story was so inspiring and she's glad you didn't listen to the naysayers. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I didn't cry. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so did your business have any issues during COVID or was, did it really take off during COVID or is it before or after? So we launched during COVID. Um, we were supposed to have this big, huge launch um, experience. And I remember uh, being at our child development center, uh, not our wine child development center, but the cultural giving tree, our child development center. And I remember them locking everything down, like literally telling us that we're going to have to shut down. And so um, I almost went into panic mode. Uh, but, and we sat for a while, we sat for probably about almost three, four months before we figured out what we were going to do because we had all these plans, all these places, you know, this place booked. We had, you know, it was supposed to be a huge ordeal. And then um, my daughter, actually, she just said, mom, everybody's doing everything online. Just do it online. Just, just, just go for it. And between her and my mom, uh, mentors, uh, we just, we literally just launched online and just started building from the ground up. And yeah, it was a perfect time for us to launch as far as e-commerce. Um, because the great thing about um, anything online, people are all over the world. It's so many people. 
and uh, people order things every day and wine is no ex- and wine is absolutely no exception so yeah it was was it difficult yes because I you had to get very creative and we had to come up with so many different uh, marketing things and concepts and um yeah it was it was difficult in a way but I'm so glad that we launched online um, because I felt like we were able to touch people more. I think we start, we began doing live, you know, the Instagram live interviews. We, you know, we start doing so many podcasts and that ultimately um, really got our voices out. So is that how you see the future of the company? Is it more internet growth? <laughs> I know. So um, one thing we also we did last year, um, we launched is called the Ebony Winery, the Ebony Wine Experience Tour. So we literally travel the country um, partnering and collaborating with other black owned uh, businesses and where we would go in, we would do tastings, we would do all these events um, that put us face to face with the people. Um, and it was absolutely amazing. I think we absolutely love online and we'll, we'll always keep our, um, on, you know, our online e-commerce, but no, we are, we are definitely a people business. Like we want to see you, we want to hug you. We want you to taste the wine. We want to dance with you. So yeah, no, we gotta, we want to be right here. (laughs) Oh, I definitely agree. Angela wants to know that as a serial entrepreneur, how do you balance wearing so many personal and professional hats? Your life, it's so busy. How do you do this? <laughs> yeah, I don't feel like it's busy. I think because I'm blessed to absolutely love what I do. Um, I, I love youth. I love service. Um, I love people and I love wine. So I really don't feel like, uh, like I'm busy. And like I'm super, I'm obviously no, I'm busy because I, I even, so my mom is almost like a momager because she told me the other day and she said, do you realize that you booked yourself three times uh, for next week? Do you even know that? And I said, what, how? And she's like naming these things. And I was like, oh, wow, you're right. Okay. So maybe I am busy. Maybe. So no, but I, but it always works. It always works out. Um, my team, um, you know, they definitely help in so many different ways. I'm so thankful for my publicist, my momager. I'm thankful for everyone who has their hands making sure things run smoothly. Because if if it was just me, then it would be it would be problematic. But because I have them to make sure that I'm on the right track, it works out. <laughs> Tiffany. It has a really good question about being Black and being a woman in a non-traditional career. What's been the hardest obstacle to overcome in order to gain equitable access to opportunity in the wine industry? Um, So I think we just had to be a unicorn um, coming into this. um, It's been us really being who we are that separates us and bringing that attention to our wine. it's almost challenging because it's it's not almost it is challenging because when you go to distributors you're like it's almost presenting yourself in a sense of proving yourself like we can know you can know that I'm great and I can know that we're great but I still have to present this to an industry that um is very old school that is very you know in the in in a certain way stuck in their ways so I have to present it in a way of hey this is who we are this is what our sales do this is we're good enough pick me pick me pick me and so I think that's definitely a challenge and because also I know like who we are and how great we are but I know that I also have to go to the boardroom and I have to you know you have to play chess because it's still business. I think that was the last of our questions, but I'm very informed on the wine business now. Thank you so much. (laughs) Well, thank you. And thank everyone for tuning in. I absolutely enjoyed you guys. Yes. Thank you so much, Camelia, for this incredible (laughs) and special behind the scenes look at Ebony Wine and Spirits. And just for sharing your wonderful, inspiring journey with us. We really appreciate you taking the time tonight. 
Oh, thank you, ladies, for having us. I mean, look, listen, it's the North Carolina Museum of History. So this is huge. We are so, listen, I'm having like this aha moment. I believe in manifesting. And uh, one thing that I love to do um, is speak and to reach the people. But I also want to be do it in a sense of where I'm able to, you know, give love and encourage people Um in the in the industry but introduce them to who we are people who may not even know that we exist or know um, about our different struggles or, or or the stories because if no one tells the stories then hey we have no representation so just to have this opportunity and this platform to continuously tell our stories um, is something that warms our heart that's amazing thank you and and we want you to keep us informed of your journey because we know you have big things even bigger things in store so keep us along for the ride we want to we want to know how you're doing oh definitely definitely and again thank you guys so much and thank you to all those of you who joined us this evening um, we hope that you enjoyed the program and that you will join us for our next program happening on march 17th um, history and highballs a brief history of the art of falconry um, for now, take care, everybody. Have a lovely evening, and we will see you soon. Bye, everyone.